I don't see where it says I am live. Hi, everybody. This is Sherry Grunska with Pro Barn Management, and it's our Monday night webinar. Woohoo! Q and A about horse barn management, and I'm so glad you're here. So um, hop on in, ask some questions. Um, I have a ton of questions we're going to answer tonight from people who have put, you know, have sent them to me and I just haven't gotten into them yet, so I want to answer those. A couple things, um, you can text me at 920-205-7518 if you have a question and I'll keep it anonymous if you want, if you have a question about your business um, and you can um, put it live right on the side here. And is this right? Is this working here? I don't see how you scroll that. But. I don't know either. All right. Okay. We're gonna go with it. Well, we're going to go with it, and we're going to jump right in. And uh, don't forget to say, uh, tell me, send your questions. Trisha's here. Say hi to Trisha. Woo! And uh, <laughs> we're going to go for it. We have a lot of questions to talk about. Um, okay. So the first one is... Um, Hi there, and thank you for your question and answer webinar. That's nice. Can you address how you do yearly vaccinations? Are they barn-wide or individually scheduled? Farrier visits, barn-wide, or does everyone schedule their own farrier visit? Then to continue on, if the barn schedules, how would you handle the boarder who doesn't want to do it that way? Hmm, I have a good answer for that. Or wants it on a different day than, than the barn and during prime hours? I try to keep farrier visits to a minimum during busy times and like them all grouped together. I have one person who will not do that and that schedules and that she schedules alone and during prime time. She also doesn't like the barn scheduled yearly Coggins and vaccination clinic and has her own appointments and has asked others to join in. And what do you think about that? So those are, um, that's a really good question and I've seen barns do it a lot of different ways. So we're gonna take this apart and um, answer a few, uh, we'll answer everything, but in sections. So how I do yearly vaccinations, are they barn wide or individually scheduled? So the way I do yearly vaccinations, so in April, I will have the entire barn, every horse have their vaccinations. And um, the way my barn works here at um, Vinland Stables is I, I'm kind of one of those people, I believe that the horse owner should have the right to choose whichever vet they want to use. And in our area here in Wisconsin, we have, gosh, one, two, three, four different vets, vet places, clinics around the area. So I let them choose. I will schedule... Um, spring shots in April from my vet that I use for anyone who wants to sign up for that. And on that particular day, I will hold all the horses and um, I will take care of getting horses in, putting them out, and it's an all day thing um, because we have so many horses here. And um, I do not charge for that service for that, that day only. And yes, everybody has to have the same shots. Um, the only time I make an exception is if a horse has allergy problems, um, a health issue, it has to be uh, vet approved that maybe we're gonna pass on a shot for a certain reason. Um, also, uh, if the horse is a, a very senior horse, it has to be vet approved that we're gonna pass on certain shots. So um, I'm always in contact with the vets of talking about certain horses that might fall into those two categories. Otherwise, everybody else gets the same thing. And um, I do a day of taking care of most of them. Now to answer your other part of the question, for people who would like to make their own appointments with that particular vet or their own vet, I have no problem with it at all. Um, but if I need to hold their horse, then uh, there's a holding fee for that and I will do that for them. Um, but usually they kind of buddy up with people or um, they come out themselves and if they want me to do it, I'll do it, but there is a holding fee. So that's the difference in that and I do let people choose whatever vet or farrier they want. Same thing for the farrier. Um, I honestly we have probably, oh gosh, four or five farriers that come to our barn and lots of people use different ones. And um, my farrier, he'll try to group a bunch of us together. Um, 
he is the type of person that if the horse is well behaved, the owner doesn't need to be there if they're working. If the horse has behavior issues and I need to hold the horse for the people because they can't come out, then I will also charge for that. Um, so it depends on the horse. It also depends on the farrier. Some farriers want the owners there at the whole time and they want someone holding the horse. So it really depends on the farrier, depends on the horse. I don't hold for many horses because um, most people just do it themselves. I know a lot of barn managers who do include that as a service and they include it in the board. But you know, we have 30, um, 34, 35 horses here now and uh, you just kind of lose track after a while. <laughs> and um, I don't want to be out for hours on end, especially in the winter, holding horses and standing there. I have other things to do. I'm working, it's a long day, and I just don't want to do that. So I only do it when someone asks me to, and then there's a fee attached to that. Most people take care of it themselves. And sometimes the um, what I'll do is if the owner can't be there and the farrier is good with doing the horse without anyone there, um, they'll text me and say, can you leave that particular horse in the stall? And they'll do them. And once they're all done, then I'll walk over and uh, my husband or I will put the horse back outside. So it's super easy and it takes up a lot less of my time. And uh, time's important when you got a lot to do every day. So that's how I do that. Um, and let me see. If you have farriers that come during busy times of your um, barn, and you are not set up to handle the extra flow of people and horses in the aisle, like let's say you don't have grooming bays and they come right at chore time, then you have every right to ask the farrier to change their schedule to come a little earlier or come a little later. You know, it's your place. You can do whatever you want. So if you need to do that, um, do it. Um, when we're bringing horses in, sometimes we have a farrier that will come here right at the time we're bringing horses in and I got to get 27 horses in and I'm coming through three different sets of doors and um, it's, it gets a little crazy there for about a half hour walking all these horses in. So if a farrier is there during the time, they'll use the grooming bay usually to get out of the way um, because they know the horses are ramped up, they want to come in, they want to eat. And, but it's really just not a problem. But if you have a problem with the time frame, then you change it, ask them to change it. It's your barn, you can do whatever you want, which is the beauty of it. So I hope that it has that. Um, and you have a person who doesn't like the barn scheduled yearly Coggins and vaccination clinic and makes their own appointments. Yep, you know, it's up to you. I'm not, um, I let people do what they want. I don't want to micromanage all that kind of stuff. And I like when people make their own appointments, it's it's less work for me um, because I'm already out there on the day we do vaccinations. I'm out there. I start my day starts at 530 and then I clean stalls and then the vet comes around 9 or 930 and they're there sometimes till 2 in the afternoon and then afternoon chores start up. So it's a really long day. So if other people schedule other appointments, I'm okay with that. As long as everybody gets the shots that I recommend, that the vets are recommending, and the, or I should say I require and that the vets are recommending, then we're good to go. It's, it's good. It, all, it works out really good. So, okay. Um, let's see. The second question here I have, and if you have any questions about this, ask while I'm talking and Trish will read it to me. We're going to, you know, for every subject we're talking about. So I hope that helps. Um, good afternoon. I was looking for some advice. I have read your book and you recommend a 60 day notice for boarders to increase board. First question, how do you figure out just how much to increase the board? Second, what exactly should be included in your letter? Thank you. That's a good question. Okay. So I do, I think it's really a common courtesy when you're going to do something as big as raising the board. I just feel out of respect for my clients. I give them a two month notice, not just a 30 day, um, because it's hard to move a horse. And if it's at that breaking point where they can't afford it, um, or maybe they get upset because you're raising the board. Either way, I feel like I owe it to them to give them enough time to look for another place if they choose to move. So for me, and to figure out their money situation, because you might have some boarders that money isn't an issue at all, and you know, raising it 10, 15, $20 is just no big deal. 
you might have other boarders where they are at your barn because they love the care you give and they love everything you do but you know they've they're sacrificing to be there they're they're trying to figure out their money they might not get to do a lot of other things because the most important thing is quality care so i try to look at the whole picture of all of it and i just think out of respect for them i when i'm going to raise the board i give a 60-day notice it just gives them um, a little bit more time to figure out their money and if they want to move it gives them more time to figure out that too um, the other part of that question was um, how do you figure out just how much to increase the board well this is where you really need to have a good business plan and you need to know what your expenses are um, you need to know it down to every penny um, and that's why um, I talk about that in my step-by-step -step guide to a successful horse boarding business there's just a large chapter in there about getting your finances under control and figuring out your expenses because you know even things like having to buy this last month I had to buy a hose <laughs> and that sounds crazy but normally they're $50 I did get it on sale so I ended up buying two hoses because it's off season but you know if you buy a hose for 50 bucks you know that has to be absorbed somewhere so you have to account so you need to know what all your expenses are your electric expense your if you have to pay someone to plow snow um, your employee expense taxes all that so you have to really have a good idea but to give you a heads up you know the cost of living everything with the cost of living goes up a little bit every year and um, there have been some years I have not raised the board and then there are some years I've raised it steadily and then la I think last year was the year I had to raise it the most I ever did in one lump sum and what happened was um, it was the rainiest we went from like the coldest winter on record in Wisconsin which was awful to the rainiest year like it rained all summer long and because of that they couldn't get the hay off the fields and the hay skyrocketed in price and it just shot right up and not only the farmers were trying their hardest it's not their fault they were trying their hardest to get the hay off the fields but when the ground is saturated they can't get the equipment in to cut it off and it wasn't dry enough for a long period of time to dry the hay so hay really skyrocketed and I had to make a, a big jump to cost that you know because of my hay I know what my hay cost every month and I know what I spend a year and I knew that we were really going to be cutting into it so I had to raise my board $25 which I've never raised it that much in one lump sum and um, so to your question on what do you put in the letter in that particular year um, I actually typed up a letter um, and I gave it to everyone and I explained the reason why I was raising the board um, to $25 and why the hay and they got it they understood and everyone was super good with it I didn't have a problem with it you don't have to tell everything <laughs> and be like an open book sometimes it's just cost of living you know fuel goes up um, you pay your employees more electric goes up wear and tear there's a lot that goes into it so um, I guess the first thing before you start raising your board is figure out what all your expenses are make sure you have a really good grab on uh, what you're spending every month if you're losing money already then you're gonna have to adjust that and that usually happens with new businesses or in the first few years because they they started their board too low their board rate and um, I did that and um, but then you're trying to pay catch-up by trying to uh, make up that money somehow and that was the biggest mistake we did when we first opened is our board rate was way too low um, because I was worried I wouldn't be able to get borders and um, it was a nightmare trying to catch up on that so I hope that answers your question on that I have a question related to that okay what is your opinion about doing an overall board increase versus charging a hay surcharge for those rough times. okay that's a good question um, so I did have a woman contact me from out east and she decided to do a hay surcharge and um, her hay surcharge was a pretty lump one for that year um, it was a lot bigger than I would have ever gone um, but she felt comfortable with it and and it worked out um, you can do that 
you can definitely do that if you want to. I just chose, um, I had raised my board a year ago and I raised it $25 a person and that included, that was the hay and then your extra yearly expenses. So I felt real comfortable and I felt that was a steady price to get me through. Now this year, I did not raise our board. So you can do it either way. A hay surcharge is definitely there, but you just need to be aware and watch your hay prices because they may go down the next year, um, but just always be aware of where they're at. And um, hopefully they stay good, but weather is the biggest factor in all of it. So you really have to watch that. And um, that's where people lose a lot of money is the hay cost because they don't realize they may you know when you're feeding this many horses it's amazing you just the hay just disappears <laughs> it just disappears and then you have to call and get another trailer load and um it adds up really fast so is there a question about the hay um not another one about the hay but there's another question on you okay to topics um i think we're ready to go go ahead and switch topics okay um okay this one says here's the backstory. okay we are in the process of running the numbers and business plan for building an indoor arena. Uh -huh. We current, uh, there we go. Sorry. We currently have been open for three years without one. Question for today or for Monday: Do you have a code of conduct, conduct or contract for arena rentals? I would like to rent out one hour increments on Sundays and nine to eleven a.m. on weekdays but I don't want anyone in there with harsh training techniques. It will reflect poorly on the barn. Your thoughts. Okay. Um, yes. So I'll tell you a story that happened to me many, many, many years ago when we first opened. Um, and I had a trainer that came to our barn and um, their training techniques were... Um, shocking to say the least i was not prepared for that and on top of it what happened is i didn't realize it but this trainer what she did is when she went in the arena she shut everything and wouldn't let anybody else use the arena and i have an 80 by 200 riding arena it's massive and then it got worse i had people who were watching her use her training techniques and i I didn't know better to even investigate um, because she was doing stuff I had not even seen before. And um, I had people calling me clearly upset at what was happening to these horses. And um, anyways, I went out and watched and I had to make a decision. It was a tough decision. And I had to tell her she could not train at our barn anymore. It, did, it wasn't a good fit for what I wanted. And um, so yes, you need to screen your trainers that come in as well as people riding and renting. I would have barn rules for them, things that are allowed, things that are not allowed to do, and uh, just be direct and clear. And yes, you can rent it out. Um, you can do it whatever you want. It. And if that's the thing, it's your barn. So you can say, um, you can do your training in here, but you can't, um, you know, like a practice, you might see someone tie a horse's head um, and to the saddle or something, tie, you know, tie them up, that kind of stuff. You know, if you don't want that, say, I don't want that in my barn. You have the power. <laughs> you got the power to do whatever you want. So, yes, you can be very aware of, uh, be very aware, uh, be smart, check out the trainers coming in because they will be a reflection of your business and the word will get out. So um, I had to stop that years and years ago and that was just my thing I needed to take care of right away. I never had that problem again. That was a one-time thing that I ever had to deal with, thank goodness. So, okay, good question. We're gonna keep on. So, uh, let me see here, I got a lot here. Hi, Sherry. Thanks for the great podcast last night. We are slowly moving forward with our stable purchasing plans, and I have been looking at all the revenue streams. I had a question about board. Specifically, have you ever heard about a barn taking a security deposit from boarders? One that would be returned upon, upon the border, providing a proper 30-day notice prior to leaving. Kind of like renting an apartment. Um, 
my daughter in new york has to provide first months as well as last month's rent on their apartment as a deposit to ensure they don't take off whenever they want to i realize it's not quite the same with horses but i've seen a few boarders get upset over something at their barn and then just pull their horse out without a notice of any kind then the barn owner loses money i've even heard of boarders sneaking out in the middle of the night what are your thoughts on a one month security deposit it's a really good question and i'll, I'll tell you so um we tried that years ago we tried um oh gosh we had a situation like in our third year everything happens like in the first five years <laughs> it's like seriously everything happens and you think this is just nuts and um i have had people back then people pull their horse out they're gone i lost money um and so i had heard of a barn in the area that also they asked for first and last month's board so that last month's board was a security deposit so you get you would get if the board's 400 you would get 800 dollars. and then if everything was in good condition then that last month's board would cover their last month after they gave a proper 30 day notice and everything was correct, you know, no damage to anything, just like an apartment, just like that. But I have had people leave. So we tried it after I had the situation and I did collect last month's board for a while on a few horses. And then I just kept tabs in a note of which clients I had. I did that with as clients came in and then as they left, if they gave notice, then I would check it if everything was correct, current, then I, um, that money was there and it took care of the board. It was funny, but after like a year or two, I stopped doing it. I just, I don't know. I just didn't feel like doing it anymore. And I had had a good group of people. I wasn't too worried about it. Um, the other reason people will do a last month's board is because when horses destroy stuff instead of the barn owner collecting the fees for whatever has been broken that next month and getting it, everything paid up currently they keep a log book and then what they do is they'll say oh okay you give your 30-day notice oh by the way do you remember two years ago when your horse broke a piece of wood in the stall or broke the fence or chewed the corner feeder the reality is most people don't remember two years ago <laughs> I mean they might but a lot of people don't I didn't want to have to remember I have boarders here that have been here for 12 years I cannot remember what the horse did 10 years ago <laughs> so uh, the reason I don't do a last month is because I just um, when a horse breaks something I figure out the cost my husband will tell me how much labor was if we had to go run to fleet farm buy wood or fix this or whatever and then I give them a total of what it's going to cost to fix it and they pay it on the next month's invoice now am I taking a chance of someone getting upset at me and skipping out in the middle of the night I guess we all are you know that could happen but I just haven't had that happen since the very beginning and I have such a good group of boarders and um, through the years when someone's been upset they've given their 30-day notice and and they've done it the right way you have a contract you could you know if they do that if you have a boarding contract which I hope you do you know you could go to small claims court are you gonna really do that for a little bit of money I you know we're all we all are in situations where you figure what will you do at that moment and you don't know until it happens I just have not had that problem in a long time um, in fact it all all my worst problems kind of a lot of them were right at the beginning when we started our business and um, we just had some people who I just feel were not very honest and did things kind of in a uh, not a cool way so you can do a last month's board if you're concerned about it you definitely can do it there's nothing wrong with it um, you know lots of people lots of barns out there do it I just don't do it anymore but I did try it and then I just kind of quit on it I was okay with not doing it so it's a chance I'm willing to take right now I feel comfortable with that so I hope that answers your question any questions on that okay um, ish, ish okay related um, you keep talking about how it is your barn and you can do what you want how do you balance your rights as a barn owner and the fact that customers are paying for a service and using 
and use of your property. For example, oh, sorry. <laughs> For example, limiting appointment or lesson times during the time when you do chores, turn in, etc. Well, I think um, okay. So I always kind of hated that saying, "My barn, my rules." You know kind of my way or the highway. I, I didn't want to have that kind of attitude, but if you're really going to be real about it, it is your barn and it's your business. So you can do it however you want. The thing is, as a barn owner, you have to be, you have to understand that your boarders also work jobs and they might have a limited time they can come out. Was there a part in them about coming out during chore time? They can't come out during chore time? For example, if you limit appointments or lessons or lesson times during the time when you do chores. Okay. Or turn okay. So I don't limit anything like that at all. We are able to function with our chores as normal every day, even when people are here. It just works out really well. We're set up really neat that way, and it just we once in a while we got to move around people, but it's just not a problem. Um, first of all, when we do chores in the morning, there's no one here because we're not we're open to, we're not open till eight, so the public's not here, so we're able to get the brunt of our stuff done before people get here. So that helps. Um, as a barn owner and barn manager, you're gonna you you have to try to find a really the sweet spot in all this, on where you got to run a business, but you also have to understand that your boarders, a lot of them, to board at your barn they ha they work, so they're gonna be out there after work at your prime times like five o'clock, six o'clock. The kids are gonna come from after school. And they're going to have lessons because that's the prime time. And if that's also chore time, then the way I look at it is you have to cut them some slack because, you know, they either come then or they come later. But, you know, they have families. They're tired. They're, you know, they have, they don't want to be out in the barn late a lot of times. So I try to find a balance on it. I don't have any time where I ask the boarders not to come. We just, we can do our chores easily every day and they work around us. When they see we're bringing horses in, they're great. They get out of our way. They are super conscientious of how we do things and um, communication is super key. If your barn is smaller or not set up that way and it's hard to do chores around people and you need to shut down things for a little bit, then the only thing I can tell you is I would be very honest to the people coming to tour your stable and say this is how we do that. If they choose to come, then they understand that that's how you do it. And they are accepting that as an okay. Now once they're there, if they start to gripe and complain, that is not your fault. You told them how they, we do things. You gave, I hope you gave them a write-up of how you do things so they have it in writing and they understand that they can't fault you if you told them this is how you do it. So that's how I look at it. Um, I try to work with my clients and they are really good about getting out of our way during that. The hardest part is just when we're bringing horses in, but it really just isn't a problem. They, they move their horse over and it's just not a problem and we get them in so fast. But if you want to block off that time and say no lessons or no, um, um, appointments therapy, you can do that. Just make sure that if I came to your barn looking to board, make sure you tell me that ahead of time so then I can say, okay, do I want to board here? Okay, I know I can't do it during these times. If I'm good with that, then I'm good with it. And it's so part of it is just huge communication, making sure that everybody's on the same page. So I hope that answers your question. Did that sound like I answered the question? <laughs> Yes, I, think, I, I hope that was. Do you have anything pertaining to that? Um, this is a different question, different topic. Let me know okay. if you want it now or later. Uh, let me see. I'm going to go on here and just see. Um, okay, this was a question that was asked a while ago, and I feel bad that I never um, got to it. I'll make it super fast because... Um, what um, do our morning chores look like? So we have uh, about 34 horses here and we have some on outdoor board so the horses are outside all the time and my horses and then we have our main barn which is 27 stalls and those all those horses in there. And uh, we start around 5.30 in the morning 
and my husband and I, and, and we're kind of like clockwork. He handles the hay, I handle the grain, supplements, meds, and he takes feeds all the hay, I handle all the rest, and then we get the horses out. And, um, and then we're done with that by around seven, um, depending on how fast I walk. And then um, I usually go in the house and have a couple pe pieces of peanut butter toast. <laughs> and they go out and clean stalls. And we're usually done with stalls around nine, nine thirty and uh, do the water, and um, that is our morning. It's pretty efficient, quick. We have all the horses out, unless the weather's bad, and um, it just works good. It's We team it. He does usually all the hay, and I do all the rest of it, the grain supplements and meds, and if he's not here, I have done it myself in the morning. Not cleaning stalls. I always have someone to clean stalls with, but getting the horses out, and I can do it, um, but you know, it's just nice to do it with two people. It's a lot faster. So our chores are pretty, our morning chores are pretty simple and um, really just not complicated at all. The horses all go in the same paddocks every day. Their hay is already out there. They know the routine. It's it's pretty, nothing fancy, um, but it works really clean. It's just, uh, it just seems to work real well. And uh, so um, I hope that answers your question. Um, okay. So one, one question here that I also wanted to answer, I will be taking over a small boarding business soon. It has been run as a co-op in the past with boarders paying very low board for outside board with run-ins, shed, hay, and water supplied, but boarders feeding their own horses. So this is a co-op barn. And um, so the boarders are taking care of their own horses and getting a much more reduced rate, whether they're bringing their own hay in and all that. And there are some barns that do that. Um, the boarders have had the ability to bring horses in at their will and use a stall as long as they provide shavings and clean up after themselves. With us moving to a full service boarding stable, charging indoor boarders for stall as well as full service feed, I'm wondering how to handle the situation. Boarders say they only use the stall when it's cold and they do all the work. I, under I understand the idea of bringing in horses for extreme weather, but what would you call extreme weather? How would you charge if they want to use the stalls outside of extreme weather, or would you just not allow it? Need to set boundaries and would love some ideas and feedback. Thank you. So this is a great question because this is a stable that's already been going for years one way as a co-op, and now someone else is taking it over and they're changing things. So there's gonna be a huge growing pains here because uh, for the boarders because they're used to doing it one way and um, now they're going to turn into a full service boarding stable and you know I'll be honest with you it's going to be hard you're going to and it's it's not I mean you changing it is going to be easy it's the people and how they handle it and I get it you know people love it the way it's set up and it's not going to be that way anymore it's like any business you know it goes through a change and you'll probably have people that will leave because they don't like the new changes. But if you do have people that are willing to stay on and see how things are going to work, um, the one thing is, um, I'll give you a perfect example. So we have outdoor horses and we have an old dairy barn that my horses live in and then we have empty stalls there and we have those stalls specifically for our outdoor boarded horses that if one is sick or hurt um, or for extreme weather we can bring those horses in now the boarders i don't charge them any extra for that they just need to uh, supply their own bedding and they need to um, clean the stall but we'll feed and everything is normal um, and I don't charge anything for that. When you ask, I understand the idea of bringing in horses for extreme weather, but what would you call extreme weather? Okay, now this is the part that's going to, some people are probably going to raise their eyebrows. And if you're a horse owner and not a barn owner, you're going to, you might look at me and go, oh my gosh, I can't believe she said that. You as the barn owner, the manager, you are the one that decides when the horses come in, not the clients. And that's the truth. So you have to set some kind of guidelines. 
because your idea of what bad weather is and their idea of what bad weather is might be two different um, extremes. So the people who have been here have been here for a long time and they know when David and I, I mean, they kind of can read us so easily now and they know when there's a good chance we're gonna be bringing horses in. Um, if there's a huge blizzard coming, if the temps get extremely cold and the wind is just, you know, even taking things down, we'll bring the horses in overnight. Um, but, you know, when someone calls me and says, are you bringing the horses in? And David and I have already said, no, we're not. And I have to tell them we're not. You know, part of me has to maybe talk them through it a little bit and give them some confidence to know that we're not gonna let their horse freeze and their horse is gonna be fine and have plenty of hay. Part of it might be educating. It depends on your clients. Um, and that's the thing I try to tell people what makes a stable really successful is when you can get clients that have been with you for years and they know your routine so well because it's so consistent, it brings them down to where they can relax and they can read it almost as well as you and say, oh, I bet you she's gonna pull the horses in. We got a huge storm coming in. And um, so I, I think part of it, it all works together. If you can get both sides, go, you know, communication, getting the trust factor, but there are gonna be times when you have to say no. And I've said no, I said, no, we're not bringing the horses in. There's no reason to, they're on outdoor board. They got plenty of hay. We fed them a ton of hay. They got shelter, the wind is low. It might be cold, but they're doing just fine. And um, I have to sometimes let them know that we're watching the horses. We're gonna make sure they're doing just fine. If a horse is struggling, I will be the first one to call the owner and say, we're bringing them in and we need to talk about the future and what this looks like with a particular horse. Usually it's the senior horses that are struggling, the real old ones that um, when the temps get real cold, it might be putting more blankets on them or it might be blanket them for the first time. They've never been blanketed. And now you're gonna have to change that and put blankets on. So I um, just remember your idea of what extreme weather is and what their idea of extreme weather is could be two different things. So at the end of the day, you have to do what you wanna do for your business. If they can't get on board with it, then it might not be a good fit for them and they'll probably have to go to a different stable and then eventually the right person will come who is willing to trust you and agrees with how you're doing things. And um, I so I hope that answers your question there. You have a question on that? Um, not on that, I have three separate questions. Do you wanna hear what um, about? Okay, let me see if I got... Um, okay, so this barn that's changing over from a co-op to a um, to a full service, you're I, you know th there's not an easy way to do it. You're gonna have to just really I think what I would do is write out a huge letter, have a barn meeting, and just sit and explain to everybody the direction you're going. You can't sugarcoat it, and you can't say you know kind of hide around well this or that and they're trying to guess just spit it out and say we're going to a full service boarding stable or we're going to a training barn you know whatever changes you're making let them know but just give them enough notice so that if they need to look for a new place these changes don't happen just in 30 days because these are huge changes and to you know give them at least two months give them 60 days to figure this all out to see how they want to deal with this and to move their horse or not, you know, and because those are big changes when a stable goes in that direction from a co-op to a full service boarding stable and now the co-op is eliminated. Um, and there's nothing wrong with it, it's just change is hard for people. So you got to kind of um, give your boarders that are there, um, give them a little grace and just kind of work with them a little and just kind of talk them through it. And uh, because if you were in their situation, it would be equally as hard. So I hope that answers your question. Okay, go ahead and shoot me one. Okay, you have three topics. I'm going to let you choose. Okay. <laughs> Proof of insurance, uh -huh. burnout, or using income towards improvements. Pick your question and I'll read it. Burnout's a good one. Okay. <laughs> How do you handle burnout? I'm the barn owner, trainer. I live on the property, clean stalls one to two days a week, work daily feeding, 
turning in and out, etc., and have my own horses. I never have a day off. Woo, you are busy. Um, well, if you have burnout, then you're obviously, you need to make major, major changes. I don't know how you're set up, but you know what? I got to tell you, the people who are the barn owner, barn manager, and the trainer all in one, you guys are amazing. I couldn't do it. I have a hard enough time just running this place. And to be a trainer on top of that, I could see where you're burned out. And clean stalls, and ride horses, and give lessons. Um, I think in your situation, it, I you know, I would probably sit back and look at redoing, restructuring everything, either downsizing a little if you can, if you don't want to downsize, then figure out your financial situation and get to where you have employees, more employees, and you're not cleaning stalls or you know, with that I can't, I don't know your place and I don't know how it's set up, but I can't imagine. You know, I, I mean, to do all the work and then give lessons and training, and I'm assuming go to horse shows now and then and all that, has got to be exhausting. The only thing I can come close to is when my kids were in middle school and high school, we did a lot of horse shows. So not only was I getting up in the morning and doing chores before and get the horses out, and then we'd be hopping in a trailer and leaving for a show. And sometimes I came home and I still had to work. and. I, I was just, it was awful. I wanted to cry. And it's just, it was just hard to do it all. So um, I think I would definitely sit down and reevaluate um, what is important to you. I don't know if you have a family. I had little kids when we first started, and that was a huge thing that took up a lot of my time. Um, and simplify, simplify, and restructure all of it. And I'd be, love to help you with that if you want to, because burnout is really important. It happens to so many people, and um, it's you got to address it. Um, it's really sad and heartbreaking when your dream job, everything that you work so hard for, just kind of falls apart and turns into a nightmare. And it's it's really heartbreaking. And it can be so much better. It's just getting it organized. And um, I'd love to help you with that if you want. So um, anyways, um, that's a fantastic question. Okay, go ahead and choose. Another one? Yep. All right. From a business perspective, we are blessed in that we don't need boarders to afford this property. Does it make sense to put all the boarding income toward improvements and avoid any tax burden? Is there a reason not to do this? Okay, I'm not an accountant. <laughs> you need to talk to your accountant on that. I can't help you with that. I can't even answer it. Can't answer it. I'm sorry. Um, I have an accountant. I, I have him year-round. This little blanket keeps falling off. I'm oh. gonna, sorry, I'm getting rid of my blanket. Just so you know, I'm a little, I'm on pillows and stuff because I'm kind of low in this chair. <laughs> so, so anyways... Um, you need to talk to your accountant about monies that get put back in the business. I can't answer one thing on that. I won't even try because I'm not an accountant. And, and any question I have with our business, I have to talk to our accountant and I see, I meet with him quarterly. I have to, so I can't answer you and he should be able to tell you what percentage, you know, the whole thing. I, I pay someone to do that for me because I don't even understand it and I don't want to get messed up financially. So that's where I'm going to steal you. Get a good accountant. <laughs> okay. I have one more question if you want to. Okay. Um, do you ask boarders to provide proof of insurance and have them list your facility location? Example, if their horse gets out on the road. Um, why? A border. I yeah, I, I understand <laughs> what they're saying. So um, the border doesn't need proof of insurance. Um, if they have insurance, I'm assuming you're talking about mortality insurance. So the horse gets out on the road and die, gets hit by a car and dies. I'm assuming if it's different, um, let us know. <laughs> Good. So we have some horses here that are very expensive and they have insurance um, on those horses. Then we have a lot of horses that are less expensive and um, they don't have insurance on them. And that is up to the owner of the horse. But as far as something happening where a horse gets out, 
as the barn owner, that's why you need insurance because um, to cover something like this and you need to talk to your insurance guy to make sure you're fully covered in case of an accident. Um, if a horse gets through a fence and gets hit by a car or there's an accident, um, whatever breaks the leg, whatever. You need to make sure you're covered, whether it's care, custody, and control insurance, liability insurance, you need to make sure you have all that in place. But as far as mortality insurance or stuff, I don't, that's up to the horse owner. Um, she responded, okay. um, no insurance for their personal property and liability if horse gets out. No insurance for personal, am I hearing? And maybe she's saying no. Oh, no. Insurance for their personal property. And liability of horse gets out. Okay. I might be saying that wrong. Okay. I have never personally heard of a horse having liability insurance like the owner of the horse. Um, my guy is Tom through Excalibur. He's great in Heartland, Wisconsin. You can give him a call and ask him. Um, but I've never heard of that. I've heard of mortality insurance for the horse being put down, you know, or whatever the horse dies. So I can't answer that completely. Um, I would check with um, your insurance carrier. And I hope your insurance carrier has really good knowledge of equine facilities and the business and stuff because you don't want to get messed up on that. You want to make sure you have the right coverage in case something happens and there's an accident. Because if there is, someone will be suing someone. It's just the way it's going to go. And you will probably get sued because you own the property. Um, so just make sure you're covered correctly but i don't i've never heard of the actual owner of a horse like having liability insurance so i hope i'm answering that correctly yeah she she was saying in addition to the facility's own insurance if they have insurance on their horse liability, liability. yeah i i've never heard of it um and my guy my tax guy i mean my um, insurance guy tom at excalibur is super conservative like he's he's like make sure he has every t crossed like we make sure we have everything in place so that if there is an accident we are covered so he would have told me about that and he's been to our place he's been to our facility i mean he knows exactly i mean everything even to like if we have stallions on the property you know we don't have any stallions but if we do we'd have to have extra insurance for stallions um, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I would call your insurance company on that because I don't have an answer for you. I've never heard of it. And so I don't think, you know, it's just never even heard anyone ask it. So I would check with that. So sorry, I can't answer it better on that. Okay. Okay. Let me go through. I'm going to go through a couple more. Um, uh, let's see here. Okay. Um, I have a small rough board facility only and have done all the work with my family's help for eight years. So they have a small uh, outdoor boarded. The horses are all outside 24 seven. I am planning to hire my first part-time employee. Would it be rude to have them keep track on a time card of the task done each day? And what else do I need to know and do? Great question. So, um, she just wants to know, would it be rude to say, tell me, you know, like, okay, clean the stalls at this time and did this, did not, emptied the grain, made up the grain for the day. You know, is that rude to ask them? I don't think so. You can. Um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, the thing, I think what happens, though, um, is oftentimes you, this person, has done the work for eight years, so they know how much time it takes to do every job, whether it's making up the grain, whether it's cleaning the stalls. They know, and if it normally takes you 10 minutes to do something and you hire someone and it takes them 45, then you go, oh, we have a problem here. <laughs> Why did it take them 45 minutes to do something I can do in 10 minutes? Your employees will always be a little slower at first because they're trying to get a handle on how you do things, but they should speed up and it should get a little bit better than 45 minutes if it only takes you 10. So if you need them to itemize stuff, I don't see a problem with that um, at all, just to kind of get track of what they're doing. 
and seeing how long it takes. And then, because sometimes they might be doing something and you thought they knew how to do it and you realize later on they're doing it differently, which is taking a lot longer, um, less efficient. So yeah, go ahead and ask them. And what do I need to know and do? What else do I need to know and do? So, okay, so if you're going to have employees, the most important thing here is um, I am, I will tell you, I do not at all recommend bartering for board. Um, you will, if that person gets hurt working at your stable, even though they've done a trade for board, there's a good chance you are still going to be responsible um, because um, the state you live in may deem it as still an employee because you asked them to do the work. So even though they're not getting a paycheck, they were still working for you. Um, and to give you a short, quick story, I know of a farm where they had an employee get hurt really bad um, on their hand and had to have surgery. And they were doing a trade for board. They were bartering um, so much off the board every month. Um, it ended up going to court and the barn owner had to pay for the whole entire surgery, even though there was no money exchanged as a paycheck. So I do not trade at all for bartering. I pay everybody as employees here. Um, I pay for workman's comp. I take out taxes and I do it every month. And I, I learned how to do it. Um, I, was, I had my accountant teach me how to do it. And I do it myself. And it's, it's pretty easy actually. And um, I, I just do it just like a regular employee. They get a paycheck at the end of the month. And, um, and then I went there this month and my accountant did all the W-2s and we sent them out to like 10 people and uh, for their taxes. And that way, if someone gets hurt while working for me, I have workman's comp and I'm covered. Um, you know, horses are dangerous and I know a lot of people don't wanna hear this, but all it takes is one thing and, and you're gonna be financially messed up if someone gets hurt. It's better to pay the workman's comp and just do it right and just give them a check, just a regular paycheck. If they want to use that paycheck towards board, then let them use it. They can do that. They can take it to the bank and then write you a check. But do it the right way and get covered. Um, workman's comp is different in every state and you need to check on what it's going to be the percentage for where you're at but that's how i do it because i don't want to have to worry and you know there's been some close calls where every one of us at one time or another possibly could have gotten hurt because of something the horse did i just don't want to have to worry and and be sick to my stomach i'd already be sick to my stomach if someone got hurt but then if i didn't have insurance what would i do then um, it would be really, it would ruin us, you know, so just, you know, that's, if you want to know, that's what you need to do. And you can get workman's comp who I would call, well, for the state of Wisconsin, you need to call in your state. Every state is different, but like whoever, who set me up with workman's comp was my insurance guy. He walked me through it, told me who to contact. And then when I called them for the state of Wisconsin, um, there was all this paperwork I have to fill out and I have to fill it out every year and they audit me and um, it's uh, I've learned you know by asking the questions okay what does this mean how do I fill this out but you know once you do it a couple years it gets pretty easy and um, and then I pay my check every May and it covers me for the year so definitely um, I guess that's what you need to know and uh, so that's it question related. Uh -huh. What if you give them a 1099? Does that save you on workers comp if you make them a subcontractor? Um, I have not done that. So you need to ask um, if you make them a subcontractor as I don't know if you can on that on that situation. So a 1099, I believe, I could be wrong on this, but like, so let's say that someone, um, I think if they still get hurt, I think you're going to be liable. But um, if you have a subcontract, you, you would be like someone coming in and working independently. Like Trish helps me once a week here a little bit 
she could be like a subcontractor, independent, <laughs> you know, um, like not a regular employee. I would talk to your accountant about that, but you know what? Honestly, it's just, yeah. to me, it's just not even worth the headache of doing it that way because if something happens, you're probably going to get, you're going to get slammed if a horse, if they really get hurt from a horse. Um, I just think it's not even worth it. Um, for the amount we, I work full time here and so does my husband. So we don't have employees working full time here, but the employees that do work here, um, we have someone here almost every day in the morning, especially, um, it's not that much per year. Um, and I just, it all gets absorbed into the cost of the board and divided out so that I know that's one of my expenses every year. Um, and it's just, I'm just, I, you know, you have, you put a lot of money into your place and you just, it's, it's not worth the risk. So, but I would check with your accountant on the 1099 and, and, and if they're a subcontractor, I think also you might want to check on working students. Um, I, I don't know about the state of Wisconsin, how it works because I haven't had one, but I have talked to a few barn owners in different states where they have working students from the colleges. And I think that might come in a different classification and that might work. Um, but I can't tell you how that all works, but I think you can do working students and then it goes under a different thing. So I would check into that too. Cause I mean, there's lots of college kids looking for jobs, especially if they're going into equine programs. So you might want to check into that too. I just haven't done it because I've always just had employees. So I hope that answers your question. Okay. We have one more question on a different okay. subject if you want it. Sure. Do you charge non-boarders for trailering in and understanding that rates will vary greatly due to location and facilities? How do you structure it per horse, per rider, per hour? Question mark. Okay. Oh, so Hollins, do I charge? Um, yes, I do charge and it is different depending on where you're at and you can charge whatever you want. Um, different places are definitely going to be more than others. And, um, I ch charge per horse. So if a trailer comes in, uh, with two horses, I would charge $15 per horse. So that'd be $30. Um, they're not gonna, I mean, I don't give them a time limit, but usually they're never here. I mean, more than a couple hours. But to be honest with you, I don't really do haul ins anymore. I say no to most of them. Um, the only ones I do are people that maybe a friend of mine or someone I know, a trainer, once in a while will come over and haul in um, just because I don't want to do it. <laughs> I just don't want to hassle with it. But if you're going to do it and you have a lot of haul ins and you can make some extra money doing it, then I do it per horse. Um, and that's how I do it. Now, if those Hollands are coming in for a lesson with a trainer, then that's different. Okay. So now you have a mother bringing two horses and two kids into your barn for a lesson. Then not only would I get a Holland fee per horse, I would also get a lesson fee from that trainer giving lessons to each person. So it would be not the horse, it would be the person. So if there was two horses that hauled in and three kids that were going to have a lesson on those two horses, it wouldn't be the two horses that the trainer would have to pay me a percentage or an amount. It would be the three kids. So does that make sense? The trainer would have to pay me a percentage per lesson. So per child or per person, adult, but when it's just a haul in someone wanting to come in and ride, then it's per horse. So I hope that answers your question. Um, hope that makes sense. So the, the person trailering in for a lesson, you don't charge per horse. Okay. Trish is asking, <laughs> get over here, Trish. So, I can see you. <laughs> so I'm a mom. Yeah. I'm bringing my two horses here uh -huh. for my three kids to have lessons. Uh -huh. I understand that the three kids get, you get something from the trainer for uh -huh. each of those three kids. Do you also get something yes. from the horse? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> a haul in fee. Gotcha. Okay. So, okay. That's good. Cause I probably didn't explain that. I right. was a little confused. Okay. <laughs>
So the Holland fee, okay, the Holland fee would be per horse. So two horses in a trailer, four horses in a trailer, whatever the number of horses, it's the Holland fee is per horse. That's how I do it. When they go to have the lesson, I charge per person taking gotcha. a lesson because that horse may have three riders on his back. Three lessons. Maybe they're each a half hour lesson. I don't know. You know, that, you know, some lesson horses are used for long periods of time. If they have three kids that have ridden that same horse, I get a percentage off of each person, child or adult, also on top of the Holland fee. There you go. So it's, it's, uh, it doesn't happen here very often because, but for, <laughs> for barns that do that a lot, I suggest keeping a log book and it's really the, I would, I would ha try to have a very good working relationship with your trainer and have them have a log book there where they keep track, um, you know, January 1st, Monday, January 1st, 5 p.m. had lesson, um, Holland, 5, 5, uh, 6 p.m. had lesson, two kids, you know, have them keep track. That way you can see who's coming and going. And also at the end of the month, you guys can keep track of how much that trainer owes you. And the haul-in money has to be paid from the, the haul-in money. So when someone comes here and they haul in, I, I either collect it from them directly or I have a place. If they've been here before, I have a place where they put the money. And they'll have an envelope with my name on it. It'll say Sherry or whatever, haul-in fees. And, um, and then, of course, the Coggins and stuff. If they've been here, then I have a copy of the Coggins on there. So... Um, that's how I do it. I just don't do a lot of Hollands anymore, but there are barns that do a lot of them. And so have a log book. It's really so much easier. Just have it right there and everybody knows what everybody's doing and it's just all clean. It's, um, do you have a special waiver for use for trailering in? Yeah, there's, there's a waiver, um, we have for, um, anybody riding in our barn and, uh, Hollands, all that stuff. So I do. And um, you can have also um, the waivers. You can get waivers online, but I would, before you use them, you have an attorney look them over, make sure they're written correctly, because a lot of them might be a general, but for your state, you have certain bylaws and rules and stuff, so you want to make sure it's correct for whatever state you live in. So make sure you pay. It's worth it to pay the money and have an attorney look at it, make sure it's correct. So, okay. Any more questions on that? Okay, what time is it? Oh my gosh, we've been an hour. I think we're good. If you don't have any more questions, um, real quick, I think we're just about done. I, um, I have one more question I'll answer because this one I didn't answer. And then I think we're, we're about done for tonight. Do you offer a discount for the boarders who don't use the barn grain? Would you recommend that? Okay. So um, if you're including grain in your board fee, like let's say you're going to include four pounds of grain, up to four pounds of grain a day, two pounds in the morning, and if you're going to include that, if they don't use it, would you, uh, would you give them a discount? I would not, but um, personally I would not, and I didn't before. Um, we started out like that for, gosh, probably 13 years now. We do not include any grain as part of our board fee. It's all separate. Um, we offer grain here, um, but they pay that as an extra fee. Um, that way I'm not losing money and I know exactly what to charge them. I charge them a discount rate because, well, I charge them exactly what I pay for the grain, but because I buy it in such bulk, I get a discount on it. So, <clears throat> um, but if you're including grain and they don't use it, would you give a discount? I personally did not when we started and I wouldn't now either. So, anyways. I'm, my voice is hoarse, and um, I think we're done for tonight. You guys are awesome. Um, I put all these videos now. They're on YouTube. Just look for Sherry Grunska. You can find them all there. And then at probarmanagement.com, they're all there. We'll be back next um, Monday night. And um, thank you so much. Have a blessed week. And uh, thanks for your questions. If you think of anything, send them during the week. And um, I might pick a subject for next week. If you guys have a subject that you want to talk about, a specific subject, 
send it to me and we can do an hour of a certain subject. Those are always fun too. So anyways, have a wonderful week. God bless you and thank you very much. We'll see you next week. Bye.